So I want you all to think about which one of these holidays are is the most uh, worthy of celebration. So pick the top three. 1817, April 15th, the first American school for the deaf opened. That was in Hartford, Connecticut. 1817, April 15th. April 15th, 1850, the city of San Francisco is incorporated. They got a charter or the state recognized them. San Francisco is now a city. Happy Incorporation, City of San Francisco Incorporation Day. Happy First American School for the Deaf Opening Day. Happy the first backwards walk across America begins, 1931, April 15th. The man's name is Plenty L. Wingo. He walked backwards from Santa Monica, California, to Istanbul, Turkey. There was some author that says that Plenty L. Wingo is walking around. He had to get some new shoes. He's in Fort Worth, Texas, April 15th. So it said that he began in Fort Worth, Texas, but it says Santa Monica. So I'm not for sure. Uh, it doesn't even say if he got into the Guinness Book of World Records. But walking from Texas to Turkey, I don't even know how you do that. I guess he says in New York he'll secure passage to Europe. So by plane, by boat, and it says he's walking backwards, around the world backwards, and he was able to do it by the sale of postcards. He sold postcards on his voyage. So he went from Fort Worth, Texas. He had periscopic eyeglasses, so the glasses could see behind him, so he couldn't, you know, so he could see where he was going. He went on 66 to St. Louis, then Highway 40 to New York, and then... There was uh, this one guy, he also wrote about Plenty L. Wingo. Now, Plenty L. Wingo, he, walking backwards, he was able to get about 20 miles per day. At the age of 36, he was able to do this. So within, you know, uh, a year's time, he was able to do this. It said from April 15th to October 24th, so just a couple months. Uh, there was this guy who wrote about him. It said that uh, when he wrote about him, he said that he came across him and he was walking backwards and the shirt said, look out, walking around the world backwards. So the shirt was actually warning people before you came across him. So that, you know, started today. Plenty L. Wingo started his backwards walk today. April 15th is a day to celebrate. You all think it's tax day? It's not tax day. It literally is not tax day. That's just some, you're brainwashed. You're, for you know, since 1955, it has been April 15th, but this year, there's, because of Emancipation Day, so if it falls on the weekend, it actually goes to the next day. It gives you a, a day or two, you know, sort of buffer there. In 2017, tax day is Tuesday, April 18th, so you actually have, uh, you know, six more days, not three more days. In 2018, it's going to be April 17th. In 2019, it will be April 15th. That lands on a Monday. So that's tax day. It's not tax day today, so enough with the bullshit. You know, tax day isn't going to happen this year until Tuesday. So that's uh, the 18th, okay? You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Happy World Art Day. It's World Art Day. Happy Jackie Robinson Day. Happy Day of Culture Day. Happy Day of the Sun. North Korea. Leonardo da Vinci Day. So Leonardo da Vinci was born April 15th, 1452. And, you know, he accomplished a couple things, right? He's an Italian. He was into inventing and painting and sculpting and architecture and science and music and math and engineering and literature, anatomy, geology, astrology, botany, writing, history, and cartography. He's been the father of paleontology, ethnology, architecture, one of the greatest painters of all time, credited with the inventions of the parachute, helicopter, and the tank. He epitomizes the Renaissance man, the Renaissance humanist ideal. He's the prime exemplar of universal genius, a Renaissance man, an individual of unquenchable curiosity and feverishly inventive imagination. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. 
is where the World Art Day comes from, the International Association of Art in their 17th General Assembly in 2015 said that, yes, April 15th should be World Art Day. And it's on the birthday of Leonardo da Vinci. So some world art. What are some artworks that I like? I like uh, Aliyah Almadi. I like Aliyah Almadi. She used her body as a protest. She said that uh, Islam is, or Sharia is not constitutional or something like that. Aliyah Almadi. I like Aliyah Almadi. Femin. Femin is one of my favorite artists uh, today. So World Art Day, it was, uh, the first one was 2012, April 15th. There's 150 artists. Those in France and Sweden, Slovakia. A bunch of people. Da Vinci is the, one of the most remarkable people to have ever been created. In the 1452 is when he was born. He dies at 67 years of age. He was born in Vinci, the Republic of Florence, present-day Italy, and he dies in Amboise, the Kingdom of France. So he was one of the most popular people in the 1400s, the late 1400s. There was nobody cooler than Leonardo. Leonardo, of course, the uh, Ninja Turtles, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, the other one. Those are all named after, you know, Renaissance people. Uh, who was it? Raphael, Leonardo, Raphael, Leonardo, R R Michelangelo. Purple, Donatello. Donatello, the forgotten Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. So who is the one that educated the sensei of Leonardo da Vinci was Andrea del Veraccio. 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 Uh, Ludovico il Moro in Milan. Ludovico. Ludovico il Moro. Andrea del Veraccio, Veraccio, Leonardo, Veraccio. So he was born out of wedlock to a notary, Piero da Vinci, and a peasant woman, Caterina in Vinci in the region of Florence. Leonardo was educated in the studio of the renowned Florentine painter, Andrea del Veraccio. Born out of wedlock, uh-oh, to a notary, so a person who signs stuff, maybe it's a civil servant, somebody pretty, Piero da Vinci, and Caterina, a peasant, a peasant. Sunday, April 16, 1944, a journal entry. Remember yesterday's date, the April 15th, because it was special for me. When a girl gets her first kiss, it's always an important date. Last night, I was sitting with Peter on his sofa bed, and he soon put his arm around me. I put my arm around him, too, and we sat very close. We've sat like this before, but never as close as we were last night. He wanted me to put my head on his shoulder. Then he rested his head on mine. Oh, it was so wonderful. He touched my cheek and my arm and my hair. At 9.30, we stood up to go, and Peter had to check the building. I was standing next to him. I must have made the right movement. I don't know how because he gave me a kiss. It was a kiss through my hair, half on my left cheek and half on my ear. I ran, I ran downstairs and didn't look back. April 15, 1944, Anne Frank got her first kiss. And what a weird, awkward one it was. <laughs> all right. She says, first of all, she must have made the right movement, right? It wasn't that he's been wanting to kiss her for a while, but she did something right. She must have moved correctly because that's um, what got Peter, you know, motivated. But he had to go check the building, so perhaps it was just he had to go, so, you know, he wanted to give her a kiss. And it says it was a kiss through her hair, half on her left cheek and half on her ear. So it was like, Mwah. Oh, what a weird place to kiss. <laughs> half on the ear, half on the cheek, through the hair. I don't know, Peter. I'm not, uh, I'm not impressed with Peter's skill. But April 15th, 1944, there was a tender moment in not to be considered her first real kiss. I guess it's the first time that he kissed her, right? But they didn't actually kiss. It was just a kiss on the ear. <laughs> 
Uh, April 28th, it says last night, so maybe April 27th should be marked down as her first real kiss. Or maybe it's just first time she got kissed by a boy, first time she actually kissed a boy. So last night, Peter and I were sitting on the sofa as usual in each other's arms. Suddenly, the usual Anne disappeared, the confident, noisy Anne, and the second Anne took her place. This second Anne only wants to love and to be gentle. Tears came to my eyes. Did he notice? He made no movement. Did he feel the same as I did? He said very little. There were no answers to my questions. At 8.30, I stood up and went to the window where we always say goodbye. I was still Ann number two. He came over to me, and I threw my arms around his neck and kissed him on his left cheek. I was going to kiss his other cheek, too, when my, kissed his other cheek too when my mouth met his, and we kissed each other again and again. Last night was a great shock to my heart. The gentle Anne doesn't appear very often, and she's not going to go away quickly. Oh, Peter, what have you done to me? What do you want from me? But if I was older and he wanted to marry me, what would I say? And be honest, I couldn't marry him. Peter isn't strong enough as a person. He's still a child. <laughs> oh, what a crazy setup. Where is she? She's all over the place, right? She finally got kissed, right? And they said they kissed over and over again. So it was like, Kiss on the left cheek, and then she was going to kiss on the right, and then they're just, mm, 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 mm. And just a bunch of pecs, you know, a million pecs again and again. Uh, was there any um, more, right, just pecs? Was there any French, you know, was there any, a French influence? But uh, and then she's like, what is he doing to me? And then he's just a child. What Swiss city of Zurich, there's a holiday called Setzelotten. Sex Latin, Sox Salute, I don't know. They burn a thing that they, it's B-O-O-G-G -G with the two dots above the O and the O. So that's what? What does that mean? I don't know. Um, the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's the boogeyman. And the idea is it's a spring holiday and they're burning Mr. Winter. So they're burning something that represents winter. And they put explosives in this, you know, sort of like a, uh, I know, what, what do you call them, with the candies, and you beat them, and, you know, a pinata. So it's kind of like a pinata only filled with explosives, and they light it on fire, and then it's supposed to be like however long its head explodes, it's going to be a good summer or a bad summer, or something stupid like that. He took the scary-looking rag doll, the boogie man, the exploding boogie man, uh, in 2006, leftist revolutionaries took it a few days before the set slotten. Since then, several boogeymans are now made, so that way they won't have another incident like they had in 2006. We don't want two, a repeat of 2006, but this is Zurich, a city in Switzerland, and they celebrate burning this boogeyman. Oh, no, or boogeyman. Yeah, how do you um have the how do you make a handkerchief dance? I repeat, how do you make a handkerchief dance? You put a little boogie into it. Also, the day of the sun. This is a North Korean holiday. This is when the great Kim Il Sung, not not the Kim Il, what Kim Jong Il, not Kim Jong Un, but Kim Jong Un's grandfather, Kim Il Sung, the founder and president of North Korea, the founder, the founder. Okay, fine. Kim Il Sung is the founder. He's the son, actually, right? Il Sung means the become the son. So the day of the sun is in remembrance of his birthday, April 15th. They go around to all the different places that he had, that has a connection with the life of the leader, Kim Il-sung, and uh, they go to his birthplace. Most important uh, observances take place in the capital. So, I don't know, the state seeks to provide its citizen with, uh, citizens with more food and electricity than it is normally available, but success is not always guaranteed. Children in particular receive candy and other gifts attributed to love shown by the leaders. Sun's Day, the day of the sun, North Korea. So North Korea, this is a very, it's the most important national holiday for North Korea. 
They've legalized marijuana in North Korea, okay? So, and then if you want to say it's weird that they're sitting there idolizing their, uh, what, founding fathers with, uh, by celebrating the birthday and they're associating him with the sun, right? Like the son of God or the sun, right? How many sons Christopher Columbus, his birthday is celebrated. He's a genocidal maniac. Uh, George Washington, he was raping all of his slaves, right? He had 300 slaves, and he also was a genocidal maniac, killed all those Iroquois people to steal all the land. He was, you know, directly a land speculating son of a bitch. He only wanted to, you know, only when it was in his economic interest, when the British started saying they were going to get rid of slaves, that's when he says, all right, let's have a revolution. I don't want my slaves. Whoa, hold on. That was Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore said that he was going to get the slaves to rebel against everybody, and then that's when George Washington's like, all right, all right, fine, fuck it. I'm in the revolution now. You're not going to take away my goddamn slaves. I mean, he loved them, right? He must have loved them uh, to fight. So fuck George Washington, okay? My point is that America celebrates their fathers too. I even get into Christopher Columbus, okay? George Washington, you know, he had... Uh, wiped out the Iroquois, and he killed a lot of Miami and Shawnee and the Ohio country. So he's a pretty shitty guy, but he, like, created the mule, right, a horse and a donkey, and you got a mule. I don't know if that actually had any, you know, implications. Uh, starting, the, the, you know, our own nation, eventually it turned out to be okay once we got rid of slavery, but it might not have been, right? We could have had a kind of confederacy, a sort of white supremacist country. But Christopher Columbus, the shit he had a he was running a massive uh, child sex slave ring with the Taino Indians and all the other Indians in you know Hispaniola. So Columbus, his evilness is right up there with fucking Hitler. He's worse than Hitler. Okay, he's worse than Hitler. The body count, he only killed a half a million. So Columbus isn't that you know uh, genocidal. But uh, half a million people, and then all, you know, the sex, uh, you know, the uh, sex ring, the child sex ring. So Christopher Columbus is super fucked up, and since he introduced, you know, the West to the Americas, he opened up the genocide that's going to wipe out 10 to 100 million Native Americans. And he started out by exploiting the Natives. He was like, look how innocent and naive they are, so let's exploit them. That's who the fuck Christopher Columbus is, a Christian who come out of the Spanish Inquisition, right? A Christian conquistador, Spanish conquering conquistador, and it's not the only holiday we celebrate of genocide. Thanksgiving is a celebration of genocide, the massacre of Mystic River during the Pequot War. Next day, Day of Thanks was given. St. Patrick, Pink, uh, Frank Patrick, was a genocidal maniac, maniac killed all. In addition to George Washington, right, he did some genociding as well. Frank Patrick uh, killed all the Native Irish. Christopher Columbus was a genocidal maniac, and Thanksgiving was in celebration of genocide. Why do we celebrate fucking genocide? Why are the, you know, the $20 bill, it's Andrew Jackson, people who, you know, the Trail of Tears. Why do we celebrate people that, you know, it's like the more you kill, the more you're uh, put on a fucking pedestal. It's like they got to cover up your... A bloody legacy with, like, adulation. I don't get it. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. So I don't think we could really take much of a moral high ground. And these are our holy days. These are holidays, right? And these aren't the only stupid holidays. You got Lupercalia, Saturnalia, Imbolc, Samhain, Day of the Dead, Ostara. These are celebrations. They're called Groundhog's Day and Christmas and St. Valentine's Day and Halloween and uh, 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 Easter. They're pagan. The pagans were celebrating Astara, and then they were celebrating Samhain and Day of the Dead and Imbolc and Saturnalia and Lupercalia, and then the Catholic Church wanted to do a universal thing, Council of Nicaea, let's, you know, get everybody in this fucking uh, umbrella, in this tent, this Christianity tent. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to put our celebrations on top of their celebrations. Lupercalia becomes St. Valentine's Day. Saturnalia becomes Christmas Day. Imbolc becomes... Uh, Groundhog's Day, Samhain becomes Halloween, Day of the Dead is also Halloween, and Ostar becomes Easter. So they stole the pagan holidays. That's why you got big fucking bunny rabbits for a resurrection. You got Christmas trees and Santa Claus for the day Jesus was born. Wait, I thought it was in a manger and the three wise men. What the fuck is all this extra reindeer? Where the fuck did the reindeer come from? 
But how does that make any goddamn sense whatsoever? Groundhog's Day, you believe the groundhog? You believe it? Since 1989, the students in Beijing have pro-democracy protests. Upon Xu Yao Bang's death, Tiananmen Square protests of 1989 began, began in China. So who is this Xu Yao Bang? So Xu Yao Bang dies, and now you got the Tiananmen Square protest. This brings me to tears when I see that Tiananmen Square man who stands in front of that long line of tanks with his grocery bag or whatever, and he just, it, it's a video, it's not a picture, and he's like sitting there like, you know, uh, trying to stand in front of the tanks like you're not going to go any farther, and the tank is trying to go to the left or to the right of him. And ultimately, I don't think he runs over him. I think that the man in the tank actually showed some humanity to the, you know, protester who was standing in front of the tank, and it's like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, they, they will run you over. They will run you over. They would have done it not. General Secretary of the Communist Party of China from 1982 to 1987, he was a high-ranking official, the leader of the Communist Party, first as chairman, then general secretary. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, he was purged, recalled, purged again, following the political career of Deng. He rose to power following the death of Mao Zedong. Ding, Deng, Ding did. Deng, he promoted Xu Yeo Bang to a series of high political positions. Anyways, the Tiananmen Square uh, protest happened when they were going to this guy's funeral. 100,000 students went to Xu Yeo Bang's funeral, and all of them getting together on Tiananmen Square, then it became, you know, with the crackdown, it became like a big fucking deal pro-democracy. So this, uh, even though the government of China censors the details of Xu Yeobang's life and the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest, because the protest, the protest happened, you, Xu, H-U, Hu, Yeobang will live, you know, forever. Um, married with children, Portlandia, Key and Peel, Donald Glover's FX series, Atlanta, Baskets on FX2, Zach Galifianakis' Baskets. Bates Motel is pretty exhilarating, but uh, Sheriff Alvel, Alvel Vérez killed Chick, who I like. I like Chick and I like Emma. Those are the two most likable people in that show. I kind of like the brother, but everybody else is terrifying. Product placement, right? See, I could put advertisements in it. Just got to talk about, you know, something I watch, something I like. Uh, married with children, right? Portlandia. <laughs> Portlandia. Oh, boy. 1992, April 15th, the National Assembly of Vietnam, a constitution adopted by the Vietnamese government since the political unification of the country in 1976. So the current constitution of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam was adopted in 2013, and it took effect on January 1st. 2014. So this is a little bit late. April 15, 1992 was the old Constitution Day for the uh, Socialist Republic of Vietnam. So they had a constitution in 1992. Now they got a brand new constitution, 2013-2014. So, um, you know, ba fam gu. <laughs> General reading and the 1992, uh, if you want to read more about their, they had a 1980 constitution. 1959 Constitution. So they've had a bunch of constitutions, right? Vietnam. Kennedy thought that he could turn it into a communist war instead of a national. The Vietnamese Constitution was not in April 15th. Maybe the old Constitution was, but I'm not going to celebrate the old Constitution. Unless it was better, but uh, I don't know. I'll let uh, Vietnam decide for itself. November 18th, 2013 would be the new Constitution Day for Vietnam. So that one's out. Right, so what do we got so far? We've got the city of San Francisco forming. We've got Anne French getting her first kiss. We also have 1900, an early 50 mile race is won by an electric car in over two hours. So the electric car was winning races and it took over two hours, 50 miles, but the electric car, what was it running against? I could not find this race anywhere, but 1900, April 15th. Uh, I also couldn't find something else. It was like the battle of some weird name. It said the Mexicans defeated the Spanish, but the name of the battle was the Battle of Azimgur. 1858, April 15th, 1858, the Battle of Azimgur, A-Z-I-M-G-H-U-R. 
and the Mexicans defeat Spanish loyalists. If you type in Battle of Zimger in 1858, all you will get is a whole bunch of that exact same sentence, that exact same phrase, you know, sitting there, I guess, uh, being all supportive of um, the uh, on-this-day kind of format. So I don't know that battle. I don't know which Mexicans were fighting which Spanish loyalists. I don't know if it was in Mexico. There was, you know, that Zimger is in uh, India. There's a city named Zimger in India. So, let's get back to what I do know. All right. So, Christopher Columbus is not a good man. Jesus was the son of God, and we uh, celebrate yeah, it's International World Art Day. So, that's pretty exciting, International World Art Day and the Day of the Sun Day, Jackie Robinson Day. There's a lot of good things that's going on here. You have... Uh, Here's something interesting. Remember in 1968 when North Korea uh, seized the American ship, the USS Pueblo? 1968. Which one was that, uh, LBJ or Nixon? So they took our ship, the USS Pueblo, North Korea did, and I guess we fought in the Korean War, right? And that was, uh, we lost, right? North Korea pretty much um, won. Anyway, so what... Should the Taino Indians have done when the Spanish conquistador done? They should have done exactly what the Native Americans did when Panfilo the Narvaez did when he landed in Florida. Spanish conquistador, this guy had actually got his eye gouged out by Cortez. Her, Hernando, Hernan, Hernando, or Hernan Cortez gouged out one of Panfilo's eyes. Cortez. He's intense, man. He said, you're going to take over, you know, this ancient civilization or um, I'm going to burn down your ships. <laughs> He's like, well, we're not going to kill them. Well, I'll just burn down your ships. You're stuck with me now. Let's go. Uh, Panfilo the Narvaez, Spanish conquistador, arrives in Florida with 350 men, and uh, there was a hostile reception, and there's actually 600 men. So Panfilo, Panfilo eventually is going to die, so this uh, conquistador who arrives in Florida did not get a warm welcome. Uh, there are 600 men dwindled down to a few dozen. He gets on a raft and then he's never seen ever again. Only two people survived that expedition. In 2015, the Poco Taligo massacre triggers the start of the Yamansee War in colonial South Carolina. So it, this one's going to be pretty much a complete failure for the Yamansee. The Yamasee is going to be wiped out. No more Yamasee for you to see. Yamasee is gone for all eternity. But would they have fared any better if they would have not fought, if they would have been, you know, um, a bunch of kiss asses? So you're going to have, uh, and then the ones who did survive ran off to Spanish Florida anyways, and it was Spanish Florida because of, you know, the conquistador. So 1528 and 1715, both on April 15th, you have... Native Americans uh, stepping up and fighting back. And in the Yamansee War, when it started, it was, you know, a bunch of people were stealing and killing and shit. And so you had all these white Englishmen, six Englishmen, go up to the Yamansee. Poco Taligo Massacre. This is going to be on the evening of April 14th, the day before Good Friday. These men go up to the Yamansee because they want to do something with the creeks so or they want to get some sort of a buffer because they're like, hey, you know, we're sorry about, you know, killing you guys. And while they were sitting there, you had Samuel Warner, William Bray, and um, Seymour Burroughs, an unknown South Carolinian. So we wrote their names down. And so that's why we remember this. So when you have the massacre of... K.O. Noe, the massacre of K.O. Noe, which was Panfilo. Panfilo just massacred the shit out of an entire fucking village. We don't even know who those people are. So, Narvaez, Panfilo. Panfilo is the conquistador. Fuck Panfilo. There's a marker at the Jungle Prada site. So that's where he, he lands with, you know, 300 men. He comes with a, a fleet of five ships, 600 men. Half of them die. And then he lands with 300 men near Tampa Bay. 
was currently known as the Jungle Prada site in St. Petersburg among hostile natives. They were like, get the fuck out of here. And um, his expedition marched northward through interior Florida until it reached the territory of the powerful Appalachian Indians. Appalachian, Appalachian Mountains, Appalachian culture. So, and then he, you know, then he dies. So, Zen's first chapter, uh, chapter of American history talks about how you had this one man, De Las Casas. So this Bartolome, Bartolome de las Casas uh, condemned all the fucking murders and said it was just, you know, sickening. So that, I think that's where half a million, uh, that number comes from with Christopher Columbus killing. Uh, so he's sitting there and they see this fucking massacre of K-O-N-E-O. So K-O-N-E-O, K-O-N-E-O in Cuba. So they're in this town, this village, and the entire village full of Indians who come to meet them with offerings of food, they just massacred the shit out of them. And then Narvaez asked De Las Casas, what do you think about what our Spaniards have done? And then De Las Casas says, I send both you and them to the devil. So, so he won. So Bartolome De Las Casas, he won, right? Bartolome, he wins. 500 Indians were huddled inside, Native Americans, Native Cubans, in a large bohio, a rounded house with a thatched roof, and they were afraid of the invaders, right? One conquistador suddenly attacked the group, and then the others followed in a bloodthirsty frenzy. Las Casas watched as hundreds of unarmed innocents were hacked to death by Spanish swords. And then he appealed to Norvaez to stop. He ignored him. He didn't give a shit. He remained on his horse, and he watched the spectacle. He was dumbfounded by this, and then ever since then, he freed the Native Americans in, in his own encomienda, his own plantation, and began to openly oppose not only the entrapment and forced servitude of the natives, but also the mandatory conversions that so many Indians had been subjected to. So their Christianity, right? Great civilizing force, right? Christopher Columbus brings Christianity to these savages, right? And uh, how did they, they force them? Murdered everybody or, you know, even if they did convert, they were killed too. So becoming Christians didn't uh, necessarily protect all of them. It protected some of them. So this uh, Poco Taligo massacre, you have uh, six of these guys. They come in and they're kind of like, hey, you know, what can we do? And they try to redress the grievances. But they also said that the governor, Craven, was on the way, so they didn't know what to do. They weren't fully pledged to war, but eventually they said, yeah, it has to be war. They put their war paint on. The Yamasee woke up the uh, South Carolinians, and they attacked them. Two of the six men escaped. Seymour Burroughs fled, and all those shot twice, raised an alarm in the Port Royal Settlement. The Yamasee killed uh, Narni Wright Warner Bray, unknown South Carolinian had hid in the nearby swamp from which he witnessed the ritual death by torture of Narni. The events of the early hours of Good Friday, April 15, 1715, marked the beginning of the Yamasi War, the Yamasi War. So the beginning of Good Friday, right? What a nice Good Friday. That's when Christ was killed too, right? Good Friday. Oh, Christ was killed. Good what a great Friday. That ain't just a good Friday. That's a great Friday. Why? It just ain't good. You know? He uh, finally fulfilled the prophecy. Great. Great. That's what he was supposed to do. Fulfill the prophecy. There was a 1715 census conducted by John Barnwell, and it counted uh, 1,220 Yamasee living in 10 villages near Port Royal, South Carolina. So 1,220 Yamansee, they, you know, fight against them for about two years. The Yamansee War is about Yamansee. Many uh, people had allied with the Yamansee, but this is going to wipe them out. So on April 15th, 1715 is when the uh, Yamansee War begins, and then it ends uh, to 1717. They withdraw, you know, then, bringing a fragile peace to the colony. So uh, it says that there was uh, colonial South Carolina, various Native American tribes. I think the Cherokee fought for with the South Carolinian uh, occupiers, but the Native Americans that they fought against was the Yamasee, Muskegee, Cherokee. There were some Cherokee that fought with them: the Catawba, Catawba, Appalachee, Appa, 
Chi Cola, UT Savannah River, Shawnee, Congaree, Waxhaw, PD, Cape Fear, Shira, and others. Shira, Cape Fear, Native American. Time ago, but essentially it was one of the you know uh, bloodiest, uh, most disruptive conflicts of colonial America. It compares to King Philip's War, Metacomet's War. Okay, and who was Metacomet? Oh, he was just the uh, grandson or the son of the original uh, Native Americans who greeted the pilgrims and helped them, you know, taught them to fish and, you know, give them squanto. That uh, original tribe is the ones who they're going to, you know, exterminate, you know, 50 years later. But that's King Philip's War, which was very bloody, but 7% uh, of South Carolina's white citizenry was killed. So that was a bloodier war than King Philip's. So the Yama Sea War is pretty vicious. Now, I tried to look up some uh, Yama Sea uh, sort of heroes or uh, leaders or individuals, and I couldn't find any. There was a city that was named after one of the chiefs, say Alta Mahal. Alta Mahal is actually a city today, and there's also a city named Yama Sea, South Carolina today. So that seems to be the only legacy of the Yama Sea that I see, is that there's a town called Yama Sea, and then what I'm about to tell you right now, the Spanish approached the chiefdom of Alta Mahal. This is also a city. I believe Alta Mahal is still a city today. And it was saying that I think there's a chief named Alta Mahal, Alta Maha, A-L-T-A-M-A-H-A, Alta Maha. And it was led by a chief named Zamuno. So there's Alta Maha probably and Zamuno. So Chief Zamuno. He always bore arms in case of attack by the Covid. Hatchet Key, it's unclear if DeSoto entered the main town. Uh, Zamuno exchanged gifts with DeSoto and asked if he should pay tribute directly to him instead of his overlord, Ocute. DeSoto is the overlord for Zamuno, and Zamuno is like, hey, DeSoto, do I answer to you now? He was like, no, you just uh, should keep on listening to Ocute. But DeSoto did erect a cross, and he left behind a cannon somewhere in the chiefdom. He summoned the Paramount Chief of Acute, then visited his main town, and then did some other shit. So, Zamuno. Long live Zamuno. Zamuno got a cannon. He got a cross from DeSoto. DeSoto didn't wipe him out. He killed a whole bunch of people. DeSoto is the first white man in Kentucky. Uh, DeSoto is, this is 1500s, right? So, this is like just after um, Leonardo da Vinci. So, that's the Yamansi. Not much silver lining there. The Armenian Genocide. Whew, a lot of dark stuff here, isn't there? Well, it's uh, the In Living Color. In Living Color uh, premiered on Fox TV in 1990, April 15th. April 15th, 1990, In Living Color, you had Keening, Ivan Waynes, and Damon Waynes, and all the Waynes brothers and sisters. They came up with In Living Color, and it premiered on Fox TV. I remember watching this, and it lasted for four years. 1990, the show won an Emmy for Outstanding Variety Music or Comedy Series. Jennifer Lopez was discovered there as a fly girl. It lasted for four years, so, I mean, I think it could have lasted for as long as Saturday Night Live was lasted for. In 1991, April 15th, Magic Johnson set, set the NBA record for career assists with 9,898 assists. Nearly 10,000 assists, right? So Magic Johnson has an NBA record, and he set it on April 15, 1991. Here's a huge thing for insulin. In 1923, it became generally available for use by people with diabetes. So people with diabetes has got insulin to be able to help with their diabetes out, right? My uh, grandfather died of diabetes. He chopped one leg off, chopped his other leg off, and then he died. So diabetes somehow took his legs. Uh, Farmer Bro would have bought insulin and jacked the price up, and then he'd been known as a good capitalist. Everybody would have hated him, but he's rich, so who, who gives a shit what the fuck, you know, people think. And uh, and then Bernie would try to pass the law, saying that he couldn't do that, but Cory Booker would be like, nah, he could do that. It's okay. So insulin, pretty important stuff, right? The founding of insulin, happy insulin day, happy in living color premieres day, happy Magic Johnson setting a NBA record day. Happy Jackie Robinson Day. Jackie Robinson in 1947 debut for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So he broke the color line. Baseball's color line was broken in 1947. So 
Nike Robinson Day is huge. This was, you know, opening day. April 15th was opening day in 1947. His first season in the majors initiated for the first time on April 15th, 2004. Jackie Robinson Day is celebrated each year on that day. The festivity is a result of Robinson's memorial career, best known for becoming the first black Major League Baseball player of the modern era in 1947. He debuted with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And 80, it ended approximately 80 years of baseball segregation. He was also inducted to the Baseball Hall of Fame, and his number 42 jersey was retired. And it was also retired on the same day, too, 1997, April 15th. So April 15th is Jackie Robinson Day. Breaking the color line, breaking the color barrier, right? And after he broke the color barrier, racism in America was dead. It was so Robinson broke the color line. Racism never reappeared its ugly head in America ever again. And what, you know, especially in this boring-ass sport, so this boring-ass sport, you know, I don't know about the other sports. How come baseball is? And then uh, Brooklyn to L.A., the Brooklyn Dodgers moved to L.A. Brooklyn's New York, right? I bet that was traumatic, right? Uh, we're moving. Where are you going to? Uh, the other, the opposite end of the country. Oh, okay. I wonder if there's any diehards that was like, well, I'm going with you guys. Tokyo Disneyland opens April 15th, 1983. McDonald's Restaurant is begins today by Ray Kroc in Des Plaines, Illinois, 1955. April 15th, Ray Kroc that finds McDonald's. Oh, there's McDonald's. And then, you know, um, after that, racism was completely gone. Never showed its ugly head ever. Creation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee begins. There's a conference that leads to the creation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the principal organizations of the Civil Rights Movement, 1960, April 15th. So happy uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Day. Happy McDonald's Day. Happy uh, Tokyo Disneyland Day. Happy Jackie Robinson Day. Happy World Art Day. Happy Day of the Sun. The Day of the Sun. That should be every day. Every day is the Day of the Sun. And so uh, there was also We Shall Overcome. Guy Carawan sings We Shall Overcome to this committee and rally. So rally North Carolina. Ella Baker leads the conference, and this is at Shaw University. So the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. That's Stokely Carmichael. It's... Um, sort of Martin Luther King, they were also, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, someday, I don't know the actual words, but something like that, right, it's a mournful, sort of an old Negro spiritual, right, in that sorrowful tone, we shall overcome. We shall overcome, we shall. 1910, April 15th, William Howard Taft is the first U.S. president to throw out a baseball in a baseball game, right? So America's favorite pastime, bullshit, <coughs> bullshit. <laughs> but fat-ass Trump couldn't even throw a baseball, right? William Howard Taft, he's a fat-ass, couldn't get out of the bathtub, but he could throw a baseball. Trump can't throw a baseball. And then why is he mean with that Egyptian president? What the f*** is about the current state of affairs of the United States? Uh, Donald Trump is still fucking everything up. Okay. So uh, we can look at Nazi Germany for inspiration. 1940, the Allies begin their attack on the Norwegian town of Narvik, which is occupied by Nazi Germany. So the Allies is, you know, trying to save and rescue Norway in 1940, April 15. And Frank's first kiss. First time she got kissed, right? She won't actually experience her first kiss until later. <laughs> uh, 1945, this is um, April 15th also. The British troops liberate Bergen Belson, Belson concentration camp, which I believe is the one that Anne Frank went to, the Bergen Belson concentration camp. And, uh, but she'd already died. So a little too late, but exactly one year later after she got then in 1945, also, the U.S. troops occupied a concentration camp called Dit. So America was at Cold Dit, and British troops were at the Bergen-Belsen uh, Bergen 
concentration camp. So, uh, 1922 security guards are murdered during a robbery in South Braintree, Massachusetts. The people they got blamed were anarchists, Italian anarchists, Sacco, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti. So, Sacco and Vanzetti would be convicted of and executed for the crime, even though they were called celebrate because they were innocent, according to many. They were being uh, attacked because they were immigrants. They were Italian immigrants in a right-wing Aryan nation, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, waspy, you know, sort of culture. And so that's why Sacco and Vanzetti got killed. In 20, not very happy. There's a couple things here that I, even though they're not happy, I don't want to forget about them, okay? So I'll just run through them real fast. In 2013, on April 15th, was when the Boston Marathon explosion happened. Two bombs explode. Killed three people, injured 264. So that's 2013, four years ago exactly to the date. On April 15th, 2013, 33 people are killed and 163 are injured in a wave of bombings across Iraq. So again, on the exact same day that you had this, you know, bombs exploding, you also had a wave of bombings all across Iraq. So weird, wave of bombings across Iraq and one happened in Boston. 2014, more than 200 female students are declared missing after a mass kidnapping in Borno State, Nigeria. 200 female students, students are kidnapped in Nigeria three years ago. In 1865, in 1861, Abraham Lincoln had called up 75,000 troops, the Federal Army. He called 75,000 volunteers, uh, and they were... Uh, Answered. He got 75,000 people to do it. They're mobilized by President Lincoln for the U.S. Civil War, which is also known as the Second Haitian Revolution. Also on April 15, 1864, General Steele's Union troops is going to occupy Camden, Arkansas. So they're gaining more ground, right? So uh, 1861 is the uh, 75,000 troops are mobilized. 1864, General Steele's Union troops occupies Camden, Arkansas. And then 1865, April 14th, Abraham Lincoln gets shot, and he dies nine hours later. He was attending the play Our American Cousin at the Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. Has to be D.C. <laughs> so, 12 April 15th is when the Titanic sinks to 27 a.m. off of Newfoundland as the band played on. The British passenger liner RMS Titanic sinks in the North Atlantic to 20 a.m., Two hours and 40 minutes after it hit an iceberg, only 710 of the 2,227 passengers and crew on board survived. 1969, the EC-121 shoot-down incident. So this is something that Trump needs to pay attention to because North Korea, we fought a war with North Korea, and they're not afraid of, you know, taking our planes and taking our ships, capturing them or just shooting them down. This EC-121 is when they're going to shoot them down. Uh, real quick, here's three other bad things that happened in 1986. U.S. warplanes attacked Libya. So we were attacking Libya in 1986. That's Ronald Reagan, April 15th, 1948. The first Jewish Arab military battle happened. In 1970, during the Cambodian Civil War massacres of the Vietnamese minority, results in 800 bodies flowing down the Mekong River into South Vietnam. Of another April 15 event. In 1948, the first Jewish Arab military battle had the Arabs defeated. 1948 would be the founding of Israel. Israel was founded in 1948, created, right? This country was created, carved out of the Middle East out of uh, however it is they make countries. Um, it's supposed to be a safe haven for Jewish people, but they've, you know, uh, stole other people's lands and now they're oppressed and another group of people the same way they were being oppressed themselves. Ironic. In 1921, this shows you how strong the labor movement is throughout the world. In 1921, it was called Black Friday in Britain. Leaders of the Transport and Rail Union, uh, rail unions announced the decision not to call Black Friday, which is, you know, signifies something bad, but kind of racist too. Black Friday now is, you know, the shopping day after Thanksgiving. But the leaders of the transport and rail unions announced a decision not to call for strike action in support of the miners. Despite widespread feeling, the decision was a breach of solidarity and a betrayal of the miners. So that's incredible. They didn't strike, and then people are like, what the fuck? You betrayed the miners. 
there's where's the solidarity at? 1921, April 15th. So it just shows you how strong labor movements used to be. Now, what is it, 9%? Nobody's a part of a labor movement. 1900, the Filipino guerrillas launched a surprise attack on its imperialist occupiers. This is like how America fought the British occupiers. And there was a four-day siege at Catubig, Philippines. So 1900, April 15th, there's a four-day 1969, April 15th, this is Nixon, okay, 1969, April 15th, uh, United States Navy Lockheed EC-121M Warning Star of Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 1 VQ-1 on a reconnaissance mission was shot down by North Korean MIG-21 aircraft over the Sea of Japan. The plane crashed 90 nautical miles off the North Korean coast, and all 31 Americans, 30 sailors, and one Marine on board was killed. It constitutes the largest single loss of U.S. air crew during the Cold War era. The plane was an adaptation of the Lockheed Super Constellation, fitted with a fuselage radar, so the primary tasks were to act as a long-range patrol, conduct electronic surveillance, and act as a warning device. The Nixon administration did not retaliate against North Korea, apart from staging a naval demonstration in the Sea of Japan a few days later, which was quick. After the Korean War, I don't know much about the Korean War. I don't, that's probably a communist capitalism thing, right, just like Vietnam. Uh, but uh, it's sitting here saying that what Nixon did, he didn't retaliate, he didn't kill or invade or do anything to the North Koreans. What he did was he had a naval demonstration in the Sea of Japan, and then he resumed the reconnaissance flights within a week to demonstrate that it would not be intimidated by the action, while at the same time avoiding a confrontation. So I'm not scared. I'm not scared of you. I'm not intimidated by you. And we're still going to, you know, do these same flights that we were doing before. And they did a naval demonstration in the Sea of Japan, be like, you know, this is our C2. Uh, but this isn't the only time, right? This is 69. They took an airplane out of the sky. They captured the USS Pueblo, the Pueblo incident in 1968. There's an axe murder incident in 1976. This was at the DMZ line, and this story of the Pueblo incident was when the, you know, um, USS Pueblo was taken, and it, uh, North Korean ships attacked the boat surveying in international water, and they were sitting there saying, you know, let's do something about it, and there was, you know, calls for retribution, but nothing was done. And it was only after 11 months of negotiation and an embarrassing apology from the U.S. to North Korea was the captured crewmen allowed to come home. Once the crew was returned safely to South Korea, news of their treatment reached Washington. They rescinded the apology. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nuh uh. Not, not sorry no more. Uh, an act murder in 1976, there was some southern forces was pruning a tree near the demilitarized zone. North Korean guards responded to the trimming with hostility, sparked a violent brawl, and then two American sailors were killed. And this, again, again, just like the Pueblo incident, North Korea said that the event was the U.S. and South Korea were being the aggressors. And this almost led to the Second Korean War, the axe murder incident. They axed the two American soldiers to death, right? They didn't just shoot them. They took an axe and chopped them up into pieces. Uh, because they were pruning a tree. So it's uh, his, similar to the Pueblo incident in that they said that they were attacked, we said we were attacked, but this was different because North Korea actually apologized to the South Korean and American governments for the event, but, you know, the relations have not been so hot after that. So with uh, Trump, you know, pushing up against North Korea, it's a fucking gamble. It's a fucking gamble. Just like when Reagan was talking tough to Russia gamble, right? It's rhetoric, but rhetoric can get out of control, and if they're actually unstable, could they? Would they? April 15th in 1902, April 15th, there was rioting, and there was arson going, you know, continuing all across Russia with peasants plundering estates just to find foods, right? So they're coming up on rich people's property and being like, hey, where the grub at? Where the food? We need some food. We're hungry. You know, and so they're invading a state. And then in the midst of this, the same day, April 15th, 1902, the Russian Minister of Interior and the head of secret police, Sip Yinjin, is assassinated by the terror brigade of the Socialist Revolutionaries. 
So the socialist revolutionaries in Russia were using terrorism. They were using anarchist, they were using assassination as one way, a tactic in order to resist. Whereas sabotage was the, uh, that's what Nelson Mandela used. He said terrorism turns people against you, but sabotage, that's against for historical events, April 15th, U.S. Senator John B. Kendrick of Wyoming introduces a resolution called for an investigation of a secret land deal. And that leads to the discovery of the Teapot Dome scandal, right? 1922, April 15th, a senator in introduces a resolution calling for an investigation of this secret land deal. What was the secret land deal? Well, you had um, during the presidency of Warren G. Harding, Secretary of the Interior Albert Bacon Fall had leased Navy petroleum reserves at the Teapot Dome in Wyoming and two other locations in California to private oil companies at very low rates without any competitive bidding. And then in 1922 and 1923, the leases became the subject of a sensational investigation by Senator Thomas J. Walsh. Fall was later convicted of accepting bribes from the oil companies and became the first cabinet member to go to prison. No person were convicted of paying the bribes, however, so there's Senator Thomas J. Walsh and then uh, John B. Kendrick of Wyoming. There's a couple people that's, you know, going after uh, either this one guy, Albert Bacon Fall. He becomes the Fall guy, so he's appropriately named Albert Bacon Fall, takes the Fall for Warren G. Harding administration. But this is on top of the Great Railroad Strike of 1922 and the President's veto of the bonus bill in 1922. The bonus bill, 1922, and the Great Railroad Strike, Teapot Dome taking bribes. Oh, yeah, all of our politicians take legalized bribes today. So I guess this is when even the scandals, <laughs> this was the worst scandal at the time, you know, 1922, the worst scandal ever to come out of presidency. This was the worst that they had. Even the scandals back then were weak and mild. Man, your scandals are weak, weak. I forget the dates of the Cuban Revolution. I feel like I should remember. That should be something I know. But Fidel Castro begins his U.S. goodwill tour in 1959. So, right, he wins this revolution, I guess, and now he's going around America, you know, doing a goodwill tour. And um, this, uh, he accepted the invitation in April 1959, and just a month before, he had nationalized the telephone industry, which I'm sure was making the United States a little bit nervous, right? You're nationalizing the telephone Companies, yeah, we should nationalize the electric companies, the internet companies. We should uh, nationalize health care, nationalize education, post office, roads, bridges. I think we should nationalize a lot of things, uh, raw materials, raw resources, coal, oil. I think these are good things to nationalize, use the profits, you know, for the people to put into infrastructure projects and the education and health of the people to, you know, make the thing work. The so Fidel Castro. So Fidel Castro is doing this goodwill tour all across the United States, and Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower is the president in 1959. It's basically a shitty start because Dwight D. Eisenhower runs and hides. He wasn't going to be in the same room meeting mugging Fidel Castro. He didn't want to talk to him, so he's like, well, I'm not going to talk to you. Instead, he goes to the golf course, right? Presidents like to go golfing. He was going to avoid any chance of meeting with Castro. So... That was bad. That's not good for the president to completely be terrified of Castro like that. He was invited by the American Society of Newspaper Editors, so Castro was invited April you know, 15, 1959. And Eisenhower snubbed Castro, played golf instead. But Vice President Richard Nixon talked to Castro. He invited Castro into his, his office, and they talked for about three hours. Nixon asked about the elections. Castro said that the Cuban people did not want elections. They were suspicious of elections and believed that elections produced bad government. They talk about uh, carrying out the will of the people, and uh, Nixon asked Castro about communism, and he wasn't clear if he was a communist at that time or not. He says that he's either really naive about communism or he's very disciplined, a very disciplined communist, and he guessed it was the former. Castro laid a wreath, uh, a wreath at the Lincoln Memorial, so he showed respect, right? He's in D.C., lays a wreath at the Lincoln Memorial. He gave a talk at the Council on Foreign Affairs, which is a New York-based group of private citizens and former government officials interested in U.S. international relations. He was pretty confrontational during this session. He indicated that Cuba would not beg the U.S. for economic assistance. The U.S. wanted to give uh, Castro some loans so that way they can kind of pull the strings a little bit. 
And uh, some of the questions from the audience was pissing Castro off, so he just left. This is Fidel. Finally, before de departing for Cuba, Castro met with Nixon. And I already told you, people that actually didn't like Castro. This uh, goodwill tour did not help Castro at all. In fact, it probably uh, entrenched divisions. The new Secretary of State, Christian Herter, did not like Castro's emotionalism. He didn't like how he waved his arms when he spoke, right? He was, you know, too gesticulating. He was too much like Huey Long. Huey Long liked to, you know, do you ever go to a barbecue? And you got one person that takes all the food. Now how about I come back here and take uh, just what you get and bring back that grub that you ain't got no business with. So that's um, Huey Long. I don't know. They hated him because he moved his arms when he spoke. Uh, maybe they're just gesticulating to get your attention. Okay, it's a video, right? You're, you have to watch. You got to see this. I can tell you, you know, that we will get to the promised land. Or I could be like, we will get to the promised land. Right after that April visit, right, Castor is sitting there saying he's not going to beg the United States. He's basically his own man. He's talking to Nixon. He's not going to accept these loans. He's his own person. That pisses off Eisenhower and the CIA. Eisenhower orders the CIA to begin arming and training a group of Cuban exiles to attack Cuba. <laughs> so Eisenhower starts with the CIA program that eventually is going to turn into the Bay of Pigs invasion when Kennedy implements it, but Eisenhower is the one that started it, and that was right after the April visit. So let's see what else happens. He's invited to meet the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He says that uh, he would not expropriate the property of Americans, and he was against dictatorships, and he was in favor of a free press. Eisenhower administration chose to wait and see how Castro behaved before offering him any assistance. The director of the CIA, Alex Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, who was the brother of the Secretary of State, who died of cancer on May 24th, that uh, John Foster Dulles. So Alan Dulles is the director of the CIA. He spoke of the possibility of using punishment politics. He spoke of Congress reducing the purchasing of Cuban sugar if Castro did not prove cooperative. So you better do as we say, Castro, we're not going to buy your damn sugar. Uh, Castro, he didn't just nationalize the telephone company, he's going to nationalize the land. He institutes agrarian reform, and the estates that were larger than 1,000 acres were subject to expropriation with compensation paid to the owners in 20-year bonds at 4.5% annual interest, higher interest than MacArthur's land reform in Japan, and repayment faster than the land reform in Taiwan. So there's land reform in Taiwan, land reform in Japan, Castro actually pays these, you know, encomiendas off, which I don't think that's a really good idea. Instead of just taking over land, if you buy the land out, right, we got eminent domain here, and if it eminent domain is for, you know, on behalf of the people, so get land reform, use eminent domain, get land reform, and then now you don't have any fucking poor people. At least you don't have any poor people that can't find a place to sleep and sleeping in, you know, boxcars and shit. At least they can sleep on some dirt that they can say is their own. Now, I am in agreement with land reform, and they, what, they got scared when they saw that the land reform happened, right? Land could only be bought by Cubans. Uh, the harvest of the 1960 sugar plantations would have to be owned by Cubans. The sugar company stock fell. U.S. executives protested to the U.S. government. More talk erupted in the U.S. about communism in Cuba. The Eisenhower administration argued with Cuban officials about their agrarian reform. In March 1960, a French ship carrying a shipment of Belgian small arms exploded in Havana Harbor, killing dozens of workers and soldiers. Fidel, a French ship carrying Belgian small arms. So Belgium was selling their small little handguns and on top of a French ship, and the CIA blew that ship up. They blew that ship up in Havana Harbor, the same place the USS Maine blew up. The USS Maine blew up, and it started the Spanish-American War, and now we have another fucking, you know, ship blowing up. And Fidel Castro blames the CIA, the Eisenhower administration, you know, uh, having these Cuban exiles, and they're considering invading Cuba. Castro publicly accused the CIA of sabotage. The U.S. protested. In March, Eisenhower ordered the CIA to train Cuban exiles for an invasion of Cuba with the Pasti uh, Batistianos. The followers of Batista, Batistianos, forbidden to join the force. Eisenhower approved $13 million for the project. 
Mike B. Eisenhower is using the military industrial complex and he is just pushing Fidel Castro into communism, into opposition. He didn't have to be a dick. They want to control Cuba, but let Cuba do their thing and just kind of see where it goes. But, you know, putting so much pressure, CIA sabotage, blowing up ships, not buying their sugar, being real petty, you know. Oh, you just give your uh, peasants some land, we're not going to buy your sugar now. Okay, so uh, the whole bunch of things is going on. $13 million is being put into the project for the CIA to train Cuban exiles. So, but, but not the Batistianos, the followers of Batista, was not in welcome. Soviet tankers arrived in Cuba with crude oil, three oil refineries in Cuba, Esso, Texaco, refineries, and a refinery owned by the British refused to refine the oil. So then Castro nationalized the refineries. He says, okay, they're Cubans now. All your equipment. Castro knew what was going on. The U.S. was declaring an economic war on Cuba the following month in July. It's still 1960, the Cuban government passed a nationalization law provided for the expropriation of foreign holdings in Cuba. Foreign holdings, right? So any foreign-owned uh, property is going to be taken over. Two days later, Dwight D. Eisenhower reduced the purchase of Cuban sugar by 95%. Then the Soviet Union announced it was willing to buy the sugar that had been destined for the U.S. anti castro Cubans had tried to take him over in the Sierra Maestros or Maestro in the mountains, right, trying to do the same thing Fidel Castro had did to uh, Batista. But they were caught and shot. Who were they? Were they CIA? August 16th, 1960, members of the CIA launched their first assassination attempt against Castro with poisoned cigars. A leading journalist in the U.S., Walter Lippmann, criticized Walter Lippmann, uh, Lippmann, who is a leading journalist in the U.S., criticized the Dwight D. Eisenhower administration for having push the Cubans behind the Iron Curtain. He absolutely did that with the assassination attempts, trying to poison his cigars, having economic, you know, declaring economic war, blowing up their uh, Belgium, their French ships with Belgian uh, guns. There's, you know, a bunch of things, probably even putting those Cubans, anti castor Cubans in the Sierra Masters, the mountains, the Sierra Mountains in Cuba. 1906, April 15th, the Armenian organization, the AGBU, the Armenian General Benevolent Union, is established. 1906 and 1912, the AGBU provided the villagers of the Western Armenia with seeds, agricultural instruments, etc. It established schools, hospitals, uh, orphanages in Western Armenia, Sicilia, and other Armenian populated regions. The Ottoman Empire is going to do an Armenian genocide in Turkey, and they still deny it today, so that's actually why it's like, uh, pretty remarkable. 1.5 million Armenians were killed between 1915 to 1923, and the starting date they said is April 24th, 1915, the day the Ottoman authorities rounded up, arrested, and deported 235 to 270 Armenian intellectuals and com community leaders from Constantinople to the region of Ankara, the majority of whom were eventually Murder. The genocide was carried out during and after World War I, implemented in two phases, the wholesale killing of the able-bodied male population through massacre and sub, uh, subjection of the army conscripts to forced labor, followed by the deportation of women, children, the elderly, and the infirm on death marches leading to the Syrian desert. So driven forward by military escorts, the deportees were deprived of food and water, subjected to periodic robbery. Raphael Lemkin explicitly was moved by the Armenian annihilation to define the systemic and premeditated extermination within legal parameters and to coin the word genocide in 1943. The Armenian genocide is acknowledged to have been one of the first modern genocides, and it's the second most studied case of genocide after the Holocaust. So Turkey, the successor state of the Ottoman Empire, denies the word genocide as an accurate term for the mass killings of Armenians that began... Uh, began under Ottoman rule in 1915. It has in recent history been faced with repeated calls to recognize them as genocide. To date, 29 countries have officially recognized the mass killings as genocide, as have most genocide scholars and historians. So it's a good thing that the in 1906, this Armenian General Benevolent Union was created. It probably saved a lot of people from having to die unnecessarily. Anna Kasparian is Armenian uh, ancestor. Happy World Art Day, Happy uh, Socialist Revolutionary Anarchist Day, Russian Revolution, Happy Russian Revolution, Happy Insulin Day, 
Happy School for the Deaf Day, the World Art Day. The insulin becomes generally available for use by people with diabetes. The first American School for the Deaf opens and writing arson in Russia leads to the Russian Minister of Interior, the head of the secret police, Sip Yinjin, to be assassinated by the terror brigade of the socialist revolutionaries, the terror brigade. They didn't call themselves the terror brigade. They called themselves like the organization, um, some militant organization of the socialist revolutionaries. He studied at the University of Kazan in the Kiev, and then he was the 183 students at the University of Kiev arrested for participating in a student strike, and he was sent into the army. And then he returned in the autumn 1901, went back to the University of Kiev, and that's when he, Stepan Balmashov, is a revolutionary. He says that the method of combating a terrorist seems to me inhumane and cruel, but it's inevitable with the current regime, combating the terrorist. I think he's talking about using terror as a tactic for freedom and revolution. He says that uh, he thinks it's inhumane and cruel, but it has to with the current regime. And the current regime was, you know, Nicholas whatever. And then this is going to uh, go to the Russian Revolution of 1905. So there's an anarchist strain here. This man, basically, you know, they said, why don't you ask for a pardon? He was like, it doesn't matter. It's insignificant in the, you know, the story of history, whether I get this pardon or not. If I don't get the pardon, and then it unites everybody. My death unites everybody. So they make a martyr out of this man. And he was, uh, eventually, he's put to death in Schlüsselburg, May 3rd, 1902. They said that he must go to the penalty or file a petition so dis discator uh, discord in the party. Some would accuse him and others to protect, spend much energy on such an insignificant thing as his death would bring together all. So again, his death would bring together everybody. So why, you know, spend so much energy to getting him a pardon? There was the murder of three ministers, Bogo Lepova, Sipyagina, and Polyev. Leave. Leave seems like he was the worst one, frankly. But these are throughout, you know, one was in 1901, one's in 1902, another one's in 1904. So these are spread out over several years, and it just shows you that this is how desperate the people are becoming, that we know people are willing to uh, be sort of uh, suicide bombers, right, in order to get freedom. So I think that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to keep this, the assassination of Sip Yinjin, uh, in because it was intentionally done. It was done by an anarchist. It was done for political reasons. And then it leads to the revolution. Everything done in the cover of revolution is totally legit. It was an oppressive regime. I think World Art Day is a safe bet. Insulin is a safe bet. School for the Deaf is really good and important. In sign language, we could all, you know, talk to each other. And I think that you could have, you know, that's another language. So if you knew English and, you know, to, even if you could, you know, hear, but you knew sign language, you could talk to, you know, somebody from a distance. I don't know. It could be useful. The minority thing. I went ahead and decided that the insulin becoming generally available to the public by people with diabetes is uh, one of the top three. World Art Day is one of the top three. And then the assassination of that one guy by Stepan Valoronovich Balmashev. <laughs> one of the founders of the Combat Organization Party of Socialist Revolutionaries. So it wasn't the terror brigade. That's what they called, you know, the press called them. It was the combat organization. The combat organization. Terror brigade, combat organization. I don't know. Maybe those are the same. Those are all synonymous. Uh, but terrorism is, is a specific tactic, which is a tactic that he used. And some people were saying assassination was a good tactic for anarchists. Um, he was a social, you know, a socialist revolutionary, so not really an anarchist killed the uh, interior minister in actually a pretty particular manner. Some said they shot him in the back. I don't really believe it. It actually says that he was dressed as a kind of would-be military officer. That's why he was able to get through. And he had uh, an executive. He had an envelope that gave his death warrant, his death verdict in it. So he hands it to 
the interior minister Dmitry Sipiagin. And then once he handed it to him, he waited so he could read it all the way to the end. It signed the combat organization or, you know, terror brigade. When the minister looked up, flabbergasted, still not fully conscious what was going on, the terrorist flayed off two dead on shots. So that sounds like he shot him right in his face. When he first came up, and said he was gone, so he actually waited for a while. And for some reason, he wasn't frisked, and he was able to easily shoot the guy. And... So this is how I'm going to end this. Uh, essentially, I'm going to pick all three of them. I have a trouble making decisions. <laughs> but it's three different holidays, and they all represent a very important piece in the chain link fence of what needs to happen for the other things to happen. So the first one is the Russian Revolution. There's you know an assassination that's a prelude to the Russian Revolution of 1905. And you need a revolution, you need freedom for the Renaissance. You need peace and freedom and, you know, uh, ample amount of privacy. So that way you're able to experiment and come up with different inventions. The World Art Day is the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci is the Renaissance man. Once you've had a flourishing of culture, then you have a scientific revolution. You have the Enlightenment era. You create insulin in order to cure diabetes.